Let's talk about forms, and specifically three things. First, form fields, like what data can you accept, like what widgets you have available to you to use in your forms. Second, form validation, so the checks and constraints on those widgets, so like the maximum number of characters a password can have, or making sure that a user has made a selection from a drop-down list. And third, form actions, that is, what logic you can set up on your forms. So first, form fields. Now, fundamentally, forms are just taking information from a user and sending it off somewhere. So you can send any data you want. It doesn't actually have to come from form fields. It could be information from a user's device, like their location or how many steps they took. But let's look at more specifically form elements. And you have three types available to you. First, when you're in your UI builder and you scroll all the way to the bottom, you've got these form elements. And normally the first thing you wanna do is grab a form validation block and dump it in. This is just a container that'll handle validations for your form fields. And then you can just add your different form elements inside here. So let's just give our form a width right here. And let's say this is an app for a school where you have students and teachers. Now we're gonna have a bunch of fields, so we're gonna need something like a column because our form element can only have one child. So let's just grab a column and pull it in. And then we can add our fields. So maybe we'll have an email address. So let's give it that name. And then we've got a password field. And finally, maybe we've got a drop down so the user can select whether they're a student or a teacher. So we can just call this student teacher. Great. And let's make sure these are actually in that form validation block and they're not. So let's just pull these into our form. Okay, great. Okay. So you have all of these form elements available to you, but there are other widgets that you can use as form elements in these base elements as well. So you have switches and toggles and that totally works. The third thing you have available to you is in your action flow editor. So let me just add in a button right here. And let's come over to our action flow editor. And maybe you wanted the user to be able to select their birthday. You can search for date and under UI and widgets, you've got a date time picker. Or if you wanted them to select a color, we've got a color picker. Or if you want them to upload some media like a photo, you can just search for upload. And under utilities, you've got upload or save media like photos or files. So that could be a PDF or anything. So those are the three places you can find options for fields in your forms. But let's look at the options we have available for some of our form fields. So we're going to get rid of this right here and come into our email field. Now you have a bunch of styling options, but we're not going to go into those because we want to look at the options available specifically for text field user experience. And those are down here in these additional properties. Now we wanna look at this because your text field is gonna be your most used field in your form. So it's important to really know the ins and outs of this widget. So the first field here is a password field. And this is gonna do two things for you. First, it's gonna give you options for this icon for hiding your password. And second, if you're using Firebase authentication, this is used for recognizing what's a password field. But this isn't a password field for us, so we're just gonna turn this on. Next, we've got the ability to show a clear field icon. So when the user clicks this, it'll just clear the field. Got autofocus option. So when the page loads, the cursor will be in this field so they can just type. We've got autocomplete options. And when you click that open, it's going to pop in a whole new folder of whole new options above here. So there's all of our additional properties down here. And it gives us this whole new area where we can configure autocomplete options. Let's turn that off and that'll disappear. We can give some autofill hints as to what kind of field this is. And we've got update page on change. You're going to use this typically when you have something on the page that's affected by what the user is inputting here. And so whenever this changes, so whenever the user types a character or deletes a character, Flutterflow is going to reevaluate this page. And if there's something on the page that depends on what's written in here, then it's going to update that element on the page. So for instance, if I had this page title bound to whatever the user had written in here, then whenever this changes, that title will change as well. And we're given a nice feature here for delay. And maybe you don't want the page to reevaluate after every keystroke because often people will type quickly. So if you want to give it a little breathing room, that's what you can do here. Next, 
We've got a read-only property that is bindable. So if you want to say it's read-only under certain conditions, so maybe if they're an admin, you can select this. This is useful for things like maybe you have a user profile. And so the user can see all their information and they can only edit it if they click an edit button. So before they click it, it's in read-only mode. Next, we've got options for keyboard type. This is really helpful because whenever you're designing a user experience, you want to reduce the number of unnecessary options you give your user. So there able to work through a form very quickly and easily. So for instance, if they're putting in their phone number, you could just have a number keyboard come up when they enter into this field. Or this is our email field, so we'll click email address. Next, we have a mask option. And this is another really great option for the user experience. For instance, for a phone number, so your user doesn't have to type in these parentheses or the space or the dash. You can hard code that in, so all they have to press are the numbers. So these number symbols right here are like variables or what the user is typing in. And so you can select one of these options here or do a custom mask. And you're given the options with a number sign that will accept a number or an A, a letter. So if I had this, then the user can only enter in two numbers and two letters. And so that's restricting both the kind of characters as, that are accepted and the length. So it can only be four characters long. And if they type more, nothing will happen. Okay, let's turn that off for now. We've also got a filter option. So if I chose just digits, the user would not be allowed to type in any letters, for instance. And so you've got these standard options, or you can add in a custom regex. So if you have a very specific requirements for what the user can put in, that's what this is for. Next, you've got capitalization options, and finally, submit type. These are options for what that final big button will say on the keyboard. So here's what they all look like on an Android device. I've got a text field, and each of them is set to a different one of those submit types. So when I click into here, it's this button down here. And so there's none. That's the same as done. The next one looks like this. Back, previous, send, search, and lastly, we've got go. So when you set these, there's two things that happened a UI thing and a logic or action thing. So the UI thing is just what the button looks like. And that's just to help along the user experience. Now, in terms of action, most of these won't actually do anything. When the user clicks it, it'll just dismiss the keyboard. But some of them, like next and previous, will actually advance your cursor to the next field. One note here, previous only works on Android. There's no previous on iOS. I'm gonna select next because we've got a next field for the user to fill out. Let's come over to our password field and just click password and make it 24 pixels. And let's come into our drop down here. And in the drop down, you can put in the options that you want here or bind it to a dynamic list. So I'm just gonna put in student and educator. And one of the great things about a dropdown is that you have the ability to change the labels and the values. So what that means is that if I turn this on, the labels go down here. So that's what the user would actually select when they open the dropdown and select it. So they'll see student and educator, but the value that's selected can be different. So here I'm given the option to set the value type. So maybe in my back end, I store the data of whether it's a student or an educator with a number, maybe zero a student and educator is one. Then I could come over and select integer and and put zero and one. And we'll select the initial value, which in our case, we'll just set to zero. And you've got other options if you want your dropdown to be searchable, but we don't need that for now. Okay, great. Let's move on to form validation. Now, there are two ways to validate your form. So the first way is to have it validate automatically. And you do that by coming to that form container and select this option to automatically validate. Now, we'll talk about what validation actually is in a second. I just wanna show you the two ways to do this. The other option is to manually trigger it. And so this would happen after every key press of the user. So it would run the validation, whatever validation rules you have set up, every time the user presses a key. And we'll talk about what is entailed with validation in a second. I just wanna show you the two ways to trigger it. So that's the first option, so let's turn that off. The other option is to trigger it manually. So maybe when the form is submitted, that's the most common scenario. So let's go to our button here, we can add an action and just search for validate. And you've got this validate form option and you just select your form. That's the other way. 
Okay, well, let's just clear that out for now and see what validating actually is. So we come into our form right here and under validation, we have three things available to us. And what will be here will depend on what's inside your form. So we have these three fields right here. So we see three things. If we were to take one away, now we just see two there. Okay, so let's undo that so we can bring that back. And there are five widgets that support validation in this form block. And those are these. Okay, so let's look at the validation itself. So once you've added in your fields and they've shown up here under validation, you then have to select which ones you want to validate. Because right now, nothing is being validated. This is just saying that these are available for validation. So in order to turn on validation for them, you just have to click them all on. Now, when you click them on, you'll be given the options for how you want these validated. And these will be different depending on which fields they are. So on the input fields, the one you're going to use most often, Often, you have minimum and maximum characters, and you have a text validator that has a bunch of standard presets as well as custom regex if you have your own pattern that you need. Now, remember that these aren't the only constraints that you have, because if you go into, for instance, your text fields right here, you have those other constraints like filters or masks. The difference is between validation and constraints. So while those other constraints will restrict the input, those aren't evaluated in the validation. Okay, well, what's validation? Like if something's valid, what does that mean? Or like if something is invalid, what happens? Well, there's two things that can happen. Something in the UI and something with your actions or your logic. So first the UI. So right here we see that there's an error message. So if it doesn't validate, you'll see an error message and it looks like this. And you can customize other aspects of that error message. So if you go in here and you scroll down to the bottom, you can see that you've got this error border color. And also you have this option for a custom error style where you can style that text. So if something is invalid, you're going to see that on the UI. It will be visually communicated to your user that this is not valid. But really the most important part is the logic. That is, if you're signing up a user and the form isn't valid, you don't want that logic to continue. So you don't want their account to be created and you don't want them to be navigated into the app. You want to stop the logic. So if you're validating manually, so for instance on a submit button, and you come in here and you select validate form, and let's just select our form and let's open up our action flow editor so we can see this. If that form doesn't validate, this logic will not continue. So if you had another action here that's create a user account and then another one that's navigate to another page, it would stop after this and not execute each of these. So that's built into this validate form block. Okay, let's just delete that for a second because there's one other aspect to this logic. So if we come into our form right here, you can see down here that we can select an action on error for this field. So let's just test this last validation here. So we're gonna turn off these top two and just use this last one. And we're gonna select the action type of navigate and let's just make a second blank page here to navigate and we're getting errors here and they're just coming from the actions on these buttons so we can just get rid of them. Okay, so let's come back here and let's select that page. Okay, so what's the error that needs to happen to trigger this action? So this would be if nothing was selected in this drop down here and you can hover over this to see that it'll tell you that. But we have an initial option set, so let's just come in here and down on this initial configuration, just get rid of that so nothing is selected by default. Okay, so let's test this out. Okay, so I don't have anything selected, and then when I click it, we get the navigation action. Okay, so those are the two things that happen when your form doesn't validate. All right, so we don't have anything selected here. So when we click this, it's going to navigate us to that page because it didn't validate. A UI thing and a logic thing.
Now, the last thing we're gonna do is look at some other actions that you can trigger on forms. And the first ones we're gonna look at are clearing and resetting fields. So let's just delete this and add an action just so we can see this. And if we search for reset, you can see that we've got these options to reset drop down or text fields. And so when we select these text fields, we can select both or just one of them. And this is gonna reset them back to their default values. Those are the values that you set up if you click in here and go down to the initial value. Every field is gonna have an initial or default value. You also have the option to clear the text fields entirely and it works the same way. So if you search for clear and under widget UI interactions, you've got clear text fields and it works the same way. Finally, you've got the option to set fields. So let's look for set fields. And here you can see all of the fields we have in our project. So if we add an email, we're given the option to hard code it or set it to a dynamic value. A common use case for this could be something like a profile page where the data from the user's account is set in these fields, but you also want it to be editable. Or maybe you've collected data from the user before, but in a different location and you have that stored, you can use that in other locations, say if they're filling out a form somewhere else in the app. So that's forms in Flutterflow.